الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته continue on in our study of Bulugh al-Maram Kitab al-Nikah the book of marriage the chapter of the relations with the wives and as we mentioned prior to this it's very important the family uh, relations and the relation between the husband and wife and we mentioned some of the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that mention and emphasize the importance of this relationship and how this relationship can be broken, meaning the divorce. For example, if a man is too restricting and difficult with his, uh, with his spouse, with his wife, that he can in turn cause be the cause for their separation, their divorce, or putting too much pressure on the wife can be the cause for the divorce. And likewise, this also relates with the husband, that if there's a wife that is too restricting, too, uh, uh, too aggressive, so to speak, with her husband, and in fact women can even be oppressive with their husband, that this can in turn this pressure can be the cause for divorce. So in this chapter, these are a hadith which discuss the relationship between the husband and wife and that it's built upon kindness, it's built upon respect, it's built upon tolerance and it's built upon understanding and love and mercy. In this hadith, the hadith of Jabir radiallahu ta'ala uh, this hadith is also going to show us that the these rights are mutual in meeting the rights of the husband as well as meeting the rights of the wife. That these are both important uh, rights that Islam, uh, that is legislated by Islam, that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, and His Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam uh, commanded us to, to do. And Although this hadith, the primarily the primary uh, cause or point of this hadith is that it is showing that the importance of not surprising one's wife by through after travel and surprising her, not giving her time to prepare herself to greet her husband, to meet her husband and to be with her husband. In the 870th hadith narrated uh, Jabir radiallahu ta'ala we were with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam on an expedition then when we arrived in al Medina and were about to enter he said wait so that it may so that you may enter by night uh, and this was in order uh, in the evening in order that the woman with disheveled hair may comb it and the woman whose husband has been away may shave her pubic hairs meaning that she's getting prepared for her husband and this is this is in Bukhari and Muslim in a narration in Bukhari it reads when one of you has been away from home for a long time, he must not come to his family during the night. These hadith illustrate for us again, and this is why they're in the chapter of treating the wives kindly, is because they are illustrating the manners with regards to uh, to dealing with the wives again so that even in this in the uh, when a husband is away for travel for example in business or whatever the case may be that when he returns he should not return at night 
without having notified his family, meaning he should not just drop in unexpectedly. There should be communication in which she is aware that he's, he's going to be returning soon. And now in contemporary times, we have so many different means of communication that there is no reason uh, for that communication not to be, not to take place. So it's very important that the wife is given this consideration, and this is from kind treatment of the wives, because this is from the advice or the command of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. From the many benefits of this hadith, Uh, one of the benefits of this hadith is it shows and illustrates the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also even from this hadith it illustrates that he took place in uh, battles in jihad uh, personally and this is illustrated in the in the hadith with the with the statement kunna ma rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam fi gaza uh, that one of the sahabi radiyallahu ta'ala an mentioned or uh, uh, jabir radiyallahu ta'ala an said that we in the beginning of the hadith, Kunna ma Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi Gaza, that we were with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the battle. Letting us know what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in the battle. So this illustrates the bravery of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that he just didn't carry a message and protect it. He did more than that. He protected his ummah. He was uh, responsible for their guidance, you know, in giving them the message. And this responsibility was given to him by Allah Azza wa Jal. And he fulfilled his duty. And part of that duty was also that he participated in jihad fi sabilillah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us also the uh, excellent responsibility or the excellence of taking care of responsibility the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had with regards to his ummah, his nation. That he was very responsible and he was concerned for them and he cared for them and he looked out for them sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this is was played out from the hadith in the way that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam advised his ummah and he taught them also by example and in this specific hadith it was illustrated because the prophet alayhi salatu wasallam uh, um, called to that behavior in that he restricted his companions from going back returning back to their wives uh, at night so that the way they the wives would have time to prepare for them because then they didn't have the um, the advantages that we have as far as communication for them it would have they would have to send someone ahead of them a writer with a message. That's basically it. Whereas we have so many different types of communication that we're able to text, uh, to call, to use the internet from its various uh, applications, to be able to contact our, our, our wives before we return from a journey. And this also shows that the Prophet Sallallahu also uh, did not allow that uh, people would spy upon their spouses. So this is very important as well to avoid being uh, suspicious and overly suspicious. 
another benefit of this hadith is that from the guidance of the Sahaba radiallahu uh, ta'ala that we see from their generation that the women would beautify themselves uh, for their husband and this is very important that we understand this and that unfortunately in many marriages now the husband doesn't care for himself sometimes even in hygiene and sometimes related to uh, you know his physical appearance because women also are attracted to their husbands they want to be attracted to their husbands so if a man is not taking care of himself we're not talking about that he has an illness out of his control but he does nothing to all he does is smoke cigarettes or or whatever and just not give any care for his body that this uh, can also affect the marriage and of course it's going to affect his health eventually that you have to give time for your body by doing some sort of exercise or walking or something your body is meant to move so from this hadith we see that from the guidance of the Sahaba is that the the Sahabiyat the females amongst the Sahaba they would beautify themselves for their husbands they would take care of themselves for their husbands and, and make themselves beautiful because this is very very important for the men to have that which will attract them and maintain that attraction so a man should not come home to his wife and then she is her hair is you know uh, unkept you know he always sees her in the same uh, garment around the home that she gives no uh, importance to her appearance this is very important that this is not the case and likewise for the man the man uh, the, the for and this is for the sake of the women is that the man should also not be unkept you know always approaching his wife he's not brushing his teeth he's not you know cl make himself clean maybe using uh, perfumes or atar you know in the house for one another or uh, you know taking care of himself and doing those things which maintains him being attractive to his wife so this is very important and we gain this from this hadith because the Prophet Sallallahu uh, prohibited the Sahaba from returning at night in order that the women would get time to beautify themselves by combing their hair and preparing themselves and likewise to even prepare themselves related to their fitra by shaving their private parts. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also that uh, and this relates to the last benefit is that both uh, parties are concerned about the welfare of one another and one of the ways that's played out of course as we mentioned through the physical that they are both trying to uh, maintain their physical appearance for one another and they're concerned about the uh, maintaining the love and the attraction for one another so this hadith illustrates that it's important for the husband and wife to both be concerned about one another's well-being and maintaining the fire so to speak that's in the marriage maintaining the attraction between the spice spouses because especially in the case of the men more so than the women that if this uh, fire goes out then men from their very nature uh, have a tendency to wonder with their eyes have a tendency to wander into areas they're prohibited from or you know things that are uh, you know they're attracted to those things so they need that which is going to maintain them in the boundaries that are set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's the halal boundaries of the marital bond or they may look for a second wife or a third wife or a fourth wife depending on the situation of the particular individual so the importance is that one another that they're concerned with the well-being of one another and and 
the meeting the rights of one another and and being attractive for one another. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also is uh, it shows us that that if someone has traveled that they should send a message uh, they should you know notify their 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 wife that they're going to return uh, when they're going to return and not surprise them in order to give them time to prepare themselves so that she doesn't feel uncomfortable and that he also doesn't feel uncomfortable that perhaps uh, she's not in the, the best of states at that time. Another benefit of this hadith is, and this is also a, a part of what we've already discussed, and that is this hadith also is evidence to show that the husband and wife should not spy upon one another. And especially, uh, you know, that the husband should not spy, recording, phone calls. These kind of things should not take place in the marital bond. And there are many a hadith, the Prophet wasallam also commanded in a sahih hadith, uh, in which he said, and this was talking about the rights of the believers with one another that uh, do not spy the Prophet ﷺ prohibited spying and as we mentioned prior that al-amr yufid al-wujub wal-nahi yufid al-tahrim that whenever there's a command from Allah in the Quran or from the Prophet ﷺ in the Sunnah that this command is as evidence that that action is an obligation to fulfill unless other evidence in the Sharia comes to show that it is no longer an obligation that it is moved to another category that it's mustahab or something like this uh, another the uh, the other point or the other principle is that when there is a prohibition in the Sharia uh, you know, there's something that the Prophet Sallallahu prohibited or, you know, commanded against doing. That this, the origin of this, the ruling is that it is uh, prohibited. Meaning that the one, that this is a prohibition. So that we should avoid that. And in this hadith, the hadith I just mentioned, the Prophet Sallallahu said, La tajasasu, do not spy. So that lets us know spying is impermissible. You should not be spying on one another. You shouldn't spy on your Muslim brothers and sisters. And first and foremost, your your wife or your spouse is your uh, brother and sister in Islam if they're Muslim, and you should not spy on them. So spying is not, of course, under certain circumstances, being in the Muslim army and so forth. We're talking about in the marital bond that this is impermissible to be spying and suspicious of your spouse without uh, due cause. Those are just some of the many uh, benefits of this hadith. In the next hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is the 871st hadith narrated Abu, uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'an. Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the worst of the people in position before Allah on the day of resurrection is the man who has intercourse with his wife and she with him and then spreads her secrets uh, reported by Muslim. Uh, this hadith illustrates for us that it is from one of the major sins to spread the secrets of your spousal secrets. And this is very important for us to gain this understanding and insight with this uh, hadith because this becomes a problem for many uh, with regards to their marriages and sometimes it is from cultural practices um, with various cultures and some from characteristics they carried
prior to Islam, into Islam, that you have groups of individuals who share the secrets of what takes place in their households. Uh, this hadith is illustrating, is talking about uh, the Prophet Wasallam mentioned the man, you know, because this is still in the chapter of uh, treating the wives, uh, the treatment of the wives. And so the Prophet Wasallam mentioned uh, regarding the wife, but it's general. This refers to the wife and the husband. Because more often than not that we find in our societies that women are more afflicted with this than men. That women will share, some women will share the secrets uh, of their husband with others, with their friends, with their relatives. Sometimes with others on a group, on, on, on groups of uh, social uh, media without any hesitation or any shame. And some speaking about the most severe of sins from sodomy to uh, sometimes uh, homosexuality or all the kind of uh, monstrous sins that are sometimes shared because of this. The Prophet ﷺ was asked, Su'ila Nabi the Prophet ﷺ was asked about, you know, what are the greatest things, the easiest way to uh, enter paradise? He said, Taqullah, fear Allah, and having good manners. That, that's high powered, that's a powerful hadith. And then he was asked about what is the thing that will make the people enter into the hellfire the most. He said, al-fem, the mouth, and the faraj, in the private parts. So those people who do not who do not uh, safeguard the secrets in their marriage, then they are doing some of the sins of the tongue, some of those grievous sins of the tongue by sharing those private moments between them and their spouse. So it's a very serious, serious sin uh, as we, uh, as the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam mentioned, alayhi salatu wasalam. So one of the ways we know that this is such a serious sin, the Prophet sallallahu said, the worst of people in position before Allah on the day of resurrection. So here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi uh, mentioned specifically that the one who does this action is from the worst of people the worst of people in position before Allah who would like to be from amongst those people I think none of us would agree that we would like to be from those who are in that uh, be you know one of those people who are in the worst that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is displeased with and that they're in the worst position before their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala because they were doing such a wretched sin. So it's very important and we'll talk about some of the ways that this can happen and when it's actually permissible and to what degree. One of the benefits of this hadith is this hadith shows us the uh, impermissibility of this, uh, this action, meaning the action of, of sharing the secrets uh, of, your, of the spouses. And this is not restricted, of course, uh, to either sex, to the male, to the husband or the wife, either one who's out spreading the secrets of their spouse saying, this is what I did with my wife last night. Oh, my wife and I, such and such, you know, spreading these secrets that are intimate relations. My wife is like such and such. These are, we would be surprised and we don't find this as the uh, from the origin of the manners of the Muslim. This is not, uh, these are traits that go against Islam. However, that Muslims uh, fall into this trait. And prior to my being a Muslim, I recall, to give an, a, an example of how common the sin is, that even as I was a when I was a non-Muslim, I, you know, had some shyness about those kind of things. I wouldn't just go out and just, although I can't say I was free from that. Of course, 
I had those, you know, we all, we had engaged in those negative traits. But I recall that some individuals that I used to work with, because of the type of work that I did, where it was easy to speak about anything and everything, and they had no restrictions. And I had a, a particular individual that I worked for who would always come in and, you know, I'm late for work because of this and this with my wife, because I did this and this, my wife this, subhanAllah, with no shame. So then so much so that when his wife would come to the work site, we all knew their secrets. So you see the harm and the the harm that this causes. This causes harm to her. And if she were to know that those her secrets were all out there about what she did this morning, what happened yesterday and the night before, she would not come. And she would feel great shame and shyness, I'm sure. And so it, it shows us that the harms of the tongue are very serious sins. And that's another thing which is illustrated from this hadith. And this hadith tells us to avoid those grievous sins of the tongue. Uh, related to this hadith and others, it's very important for us to understand that there are times when it becomes permissible. There are times when it becomes permissible. And we understand that from other ahadith which illustrate this. Because how do we know some of the things that the Prophet ﷺ did in his home. We know that from his wives. May Allah be pleased with all of them. That we there was a, a, a need for the Ummah to know, and of course no, not knowing all the details. The details we don't have. All the specific details, of course not. But we have what we need to know how to have uh, lawful relations and what is permissible and what is not permissible related to a hukum shari, related to a sharia ruling. We know this from what the Prophet ﷺ did with his wives and what they shared with us through uh, narrations on the sahabiyat uh, of, the, of the, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. So that lets us know that there are permissible times for example, if you're going before a judge or you need a fatwa, then it may not be necessary to talk about uh, the judge is going to be to your specific case. The judge is going to ask you and you may need to bring details for some uh, some wrongdoings or taking of the rights or oppression or sinfulness or whatever the case may be that happen in, within the marriage. So this may be in that situation, this would not be mithmum, it would not be impermissible. This would be a permissible time because it's absolute necessary. So there are sharia, uh, there are times when there is, uh, a, a, when it's permissible. Another example, which we find all the time, and that again, in these situations, it's usually not necessary that the specific individuals are mentioned. But however, a woman will send a question, and this happens in many countries, from the students of knowledge to the sheikhs in those countries, uh, likewise uh, here and, and all over the world, that women, they have a need for fatwa. You know, so then they have to describe the situation that maybe takes place in their home. Uh, you know, sheikh, I'm having such and such problem, my husband is doing such and such. And this can even be personal things in the bedroom without mentioning her and her husband so as not to destroy the integrity of her husband because there is probably no need for mentioning those specific individuals. But rather there is a need for the fatwa to understand the situation and how to deal with the situation and what is the sharia ruling pertaining to the situation. So those are two examples. And we have to understand to be very careful that it's not... Uh, necessary to make uh, to specify because there are cases where some women they will call across the world to get fatwa about their husband in a particular land and they will use his name and it will to destroy his integrity we sometimes it's to destroy his integrity sometimes it may not be to destroy his integrity but maybe the people that are get, trying to get fatwa or trying to get clarity about an issue are prying. So it's very important that we understand the Sharia principles 
when it's a necessity and when it's not a necessity, when it's permissible and when it's impermissible. Because then it can turn into backbiting and, and a character assassination versus trying to get a Sharia ruling for a real situation that is taking place. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates for us that people have different levels with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People have different levels and status with Allah Azza wa Jal. Because the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned in the hadith that uh, the worst of people in position before Allah. So what we understand that there are people who are the best, who are in the best of position before Allah. And then there's people who are in the middle of that, in between those two poles, so to speak. And, on a, um, and so on and so forth. That letting us know that people have different uh, levels with Allah Azza wa Jal. And likewise, what can be understand from this, understood from this hadith is that people have different levels of Iman as well. That this hadith also indicates for us that uh, because people have different le levels, levels of status, that is, an Ill, that is also an evidence to show that people have different levels of Iman. That Iman fluctuates. Sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low. And some people are stronger than others in Iman. So that's very important for us to understand and that is another benefit derived from this hadith. Another example, uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also uh, illustrates for us or affirms for us uh, Yom Al-Qiyamah, the day of judgment exists. That there is a day of judgment. That we all will be resurrected out of our graves. Uh, and so this hadith is another example or another evidence for that, for the Day of Judgment. Because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith his, uh, when he said, وسلم, he said, uh, the worst of people in position before Allah on the Day of Resurrection. So he specified that this was on the Day of Resurrection, that these are the people who be the worst uh, with Allah, the ones who, you know, did not keep their marital secrets in the home. A last uh, benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us the obligation of covering uh, the faults of one another and more specifically the spouses. That the husbands should be covering the sins of their wives and likewise the wives should be covering the sins of their husbands that shortcomings that they have with their spouse should not be uh, brought out into the public sphere that these should remain in the home between them unless there is a haja unless there is a need a necessity to take those uh, to uncover these sins and we already mentioned the, some of the cases in the need for fatwa in the need of a court a going before a Muslim judge or whatever the case may be uh, that in these particular uh, circumstances then it may require that but other than this it should not be uh, the secrets and the faults of one another should be covered we should not be going and advertising anyone's sins those are some of the uh, some of the many benefits of this hadith. In discussing the importance of good and righteous conduct with the wives and this is the example of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam it becomes important for us to discuss the rights of the husband and wife and in the next hadith the topic of the hadith is that 
it relates to what are the rights of the wife upon the husband. So it's important for us to give a, a, a general understanding before we read that hadith of some of the rights or some of the most important rights of the husband and the wife. So that way we have a good uh, tesor or preview and way of looking at this hadith that we're about to study. And from the rights that are shared between the husband and the wife, one of the first rights, which is very important, and we've mentioned this throughout this uh, study in this, this chapter, is the haq of istimta, meaning the right of enjoying one another. This is very important. This is one of the uh, muqasid or the intents of the marital bond is so that way you can have halal relations which is in accordance with your fitra, which is in accordance with your natural nature. And so the right of enjoyment or of enjoying one another, the of, of fulfilling one another's desires in a righteous way, that this is the right of both the husband and the wife. The second right which is shared between the husband and wife is the right of uh, of good conduct and kind treatment. That both of them have this right of being treated kindly, not being treated with uh, enmity or hatred or uh, being treated in a, in a way which is uh, unacceptable for anyone to treat and, and unbefitting of a Muslim. So they both have the right for good, righteous treatment. The third right is that they should, that they both uh, share, is that they should work to work together, uh, cooperate in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is very important. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَعَوَنَا لَبِرِ وَتَقْوَى وَلَا تَعَوَنَا لَإِثْمِ وَعُدْوَانِ And cooperate uh, in righteousness and piety and do not cooperate in enmity in Udwan, you know, in 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 in, in uh, hatred and in in evil, basically. So, we've talked about this prior to this, but it's very important that we understand this in the context of uh, the marital life. So, for instance, a husband and wife both should be uh, encouraging one another to obedience to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, like the prayer. If the husband is lazy with regards to getting up for the prayer or uh, regarding prayer in general or Jumwa or fasting or what have you, the wife should be there to encourage him and uh, uh, to assist him in obedience to Allah. Likewise, the opposite, that the woman should be encouraged by her husband. So they should encourage one another. Also, if they see disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from either party, they should encourage. This is a part of commanding the good and forbidding the evil. And that's in accordance with the hadith uh, amongst all the adillah from the Quran and the Sunnah. But the hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala where he said, Man ra'a minkum munkarin. Whoever sees um, something sinful, then change it with his hand. And if he's unable to, with his uh, tongue. Muslim. In this hadith in Sahih Muslim, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said that you should change the evil either physically with your hand or speak out against it with your tongue or hate it in your heart and that's the weakest form of Iman. So all of us can do one of those levels of uh, uh, illustrate one of those levels of of Iman and one of those levels of commanding the good and forbidding the evil. And so this is a right that the husband and wife have over one another. And again, that does not necessitate that you bring the uh, what's going on in your house out into the public eye. But rather, this can be these invitations, especially if you have a religious household, then that can be sufficient to tell one another, you need to, you, you should start praying back in the masjid again. 
uh, you need to get up and make sure you're not late for the salat. Sometimes you oversleep on a regular basis. Uh, you need to, you know, you should try, you know, and encourage one another to do the recommended acts as well. You know, let's get up together and do Qiyam al-Layl. I know you have a work, tough work schedule. At least let's do it on the weekend. Whatever the case may be. No, let's not involve ourselves in this activity, but let's involve ourselves in this activity. So this is the command in the good and forbidden evil, and this is a right of both uh, of both husband and wife. Another shared uh, right between the husband and wife is that they both have a responsibility to maintain their household, to maintain the household, whether it is uh, physically maintaining it or the spiritual, keeping the spirit, spiritual spirituality maintained in the household by righteous conduct and, and goodness and good manners uh, and doing the obligatory duties. So also, uh, what is uh, an issue that arises here that also the husband should, should have an idea about the friends of his wife and likewise the wife about the husband in that they see they can advise one another. You know, and say, you know, for example, the husband can advise his wife, I don't want you to be around those sisters because those sisters only backbite. They have such and such group, a WhatsApp group or, or whatever, some social media group, and all they do is, uh, is talk about the secrets of their husbands or whatever the case may be. This is a part of shutting down the munkar, you know, uh, either encouraging or enforcing your, your wife to not be a part of those types of groups or be with those people, or the people of bid'ah and innovation. This is also part of the spiritual, maintaining the spirituality in the household that the wife, the husband should know if the wife is around people of innovation and desires, the people who are calling her to sinfulness, or calling her, his wife to, to be an extremist, to be extreme in, in uh, you know, in whatever, in any of the issues of being extreme regarding to the religion of Islam. And likewise, the wife, if she has that ability, with her husband. Those are some of the important, important shared responsibility. As far as the uh, rights of the husband over the wife, then these can be summarized as follow. One of the things that we'll see in this, uh, not in this hadith, but in the, uh, we will explore this topic more, uh, is one of the things is that the right of being of, uh, of obedience, meaning that the wife should be obedient to her husband, that she must follow the uh, the commands of her husband as long as he's not calling her to uh, disbelief, innovation in the religion, um, and, and any other uh, negative uh, sinfulness, anything which is disobedience to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Uh, that doesn't negate that they can't uh, have shura and counsel together, and he can consult his wife, but it means that. The ultimate decision rests in the hands of the husband. That's a part of the what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him as a status over his wives. The second uh, right that the husband has over the wife is that uh, that to that the husband he should that he gives the wife the responsibility to uh, organize the affairs of the household. Okay, the husband can maybe general, but this is uh, something that he may give her the as a right or, or as a responsibility for her to do that. Especially if she's a wife, she's a stay-home wife. She's not uh, out in the workforce because every situation for everyone is different. And if one, if two parties are equally out in the workforce he works eight hours, she works eight hours, then they as a family can determine what is best for them. Uh, then another right he has over her is that she should preserve his wealth. She should not uh, take and be extravagant uh, from her husband's wealth uh, and property. She should preserve his house, not uh, loaning his items without her permission. Oh yes, here's some books. Oh, my husband has that book. Go ahead and take it, or whatever the case may be. No, that's she. She her responsibility is to preserve his wealth and the household. Another uh, responsibility, uh, another right, is that 
the they both have is that they both should have a positive and not a pessimistic view of one another so the husband should have a uh, not be suspicious of his wife and be uh, have a good thought about her a positive thought be positive likewise and we talked about this in the prior hadith that we studied is that the another right is to protect and preserve the secrets of the wives or the uh, that the wife should pre protect and preserve his secrets and this goes for both parties in fact another right that the husband has over the wife is that she should be responsible for uh, the tarbia or the education of the children because especially in a traditional setting a traditional home where the wife is not uh, working and so forth and she is with those children she's responsible for putting into putting in goodness in the children teaching them about the religion to the best of her ability encouraging them to re religious and good righteous studies and their other studies all their studies she is responsible and for good manners she is responsible because the husband he is busy in the workforce he is doing other activities and then he comes home and it's difficult but and he has he shares in that responsibility but ultimately that tarbia and the first madrasa the first uh, institute of learning is with the wife another right is that uh, the wife should be uh, she should be righteous with her husband and she should be righteous with the family of her husband she should try to maintain good ties for example with his mother if his mother is fa and father uh, his you know his, his family members that she should be with good manners and this is regardless of whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim so this is very important for us to have some understanding of that those are some of the most important uh, rights that the husband has over the wife and I believe we mentioned that of course that she should beautify herself and uh, be uh, ready and accepting of her husband's call to uh, to have relations this is very very important part of the marital bond in Islam uh, as far as the right of the wives or the wife over the the husband this comes down uh, as we mentioned those rights that are shared and there is the that comes down to two very important uh, rights and that is aside from what we've already mentioned and that that comes down to for one one of the rights is her her mahar in case the mahar has been delayed we need the dowry that uh, she has a right to that her mahar that is a right and we talked about the the uh, akta the the marital contract and that is a right of the wife over the husband likewise there's the financial of maintenance of maintaining her clothing and we'll see this in the hadith we're about to study in main, maintaining her her uh, clothing her uh, household bringing her you know a household to the extent of his ability his ability her clothing and food those basic necessities that we all require to a greater or lesser extent that that is the right of the wife over the husband as it, and those are the most key rights aside from just being righteous and that's what this whole chapter is that we've been studying uh, about is how to uh, you know uh, live together in kindness kind treatment of the wives so those are probably the most important uh, uh, rights and also uh, along with that is that the right of uh, that uh, the wife has the right to be taught about Islam to be taught about Islam that's a right and that's a reminder for us to make sure our households have some Islamic uh, reminders in there because many households unfortunately many Muslim households 
they have so many other they have the latest movies they have the latest films and the latest this and that and the other and music but they don't have uh, maybe any Islamic books and they don't have any time and especially shared time it's just up to everyone just to do as they please but this is not from the Islamic uh, meeting the Islamic tarbia. in fact the wife has rights over her husband uh, and the children as well to be taught Islam especially if he has something to offer his family likewise uh, just general tarbia of you know making sure the house is a righteous house that it is not a lot of sinfulness and munkarat and that people are doing their Islamic duties and we already mentioned the kindnesses and the the other aspects uh, of the religion and if there is more than one wife and then we'll explore this a bit more then of course there needs to be justice between the uh, between the the wives that the husband must meet the responsibilities of his 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 uh, his various wives uh, equally and of course that is impossible to be equal as far as what is contained in the heart but as far as what is contained financially uh, and materially that the husband must do his utmost to be uh, just with that and justice as a little aside does not always mean the exact equality and what I mean it by that is is that for example a husband might have a wife who lives in a, a very poor country but she requires for example five hundred six hundred dollars a month let's say and another wife might live in a Western cut you know in America or the UK or what have you and she requires fifteen hundred a month to sustain her household and the one who is receiving five hundred lives in accordance with the one who lives in fifteen hundred or perhaps even better because for that amount of money in that country that is sufficient so it's not necessarily equal in terms of the actual amount spent but equal in terms of the living standards and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best 